Welcome to the latest installment of the AST AJT Journal Club series. Today's Journal Club, The Survival Advantage of Pancreas After Kidney Transplant, is hosted by the AST Kidney Pancreas Community of Practice. In a moment, I will turn the discussion over to our moderator, Dr. John Odorico from the University of Wisconsin-Madison School of Medicine and Public Health, who will introduce our presenter, Dr. Jonathan Fridell from the University of Indiana School of Medicine. But first, we have a few housekeeping notes to help you engage today with today's discussion. There is currently a viewership polling question displayed for the audience. Please take a moment to answer this question while we finish the remaining announcements. Please note that all of your lines have been muted so that only the presenters can be heard for the recording. If you have a question during the Journal Club, please use the Questions tab in the GoToWebinar panel. You can find this tab near the bottom of your panel. If there are any questions we do not have time for, we will either answer them individually offline or we will post the full question and answer to the website following the Journal Club. Please be aware that if you click the X icon in the upper right of the GoToWebinar panel, you will close and exit the webinar. As noted, this Journal Club is being recorded and the archive will be available within 24 to 48 hours. Finally, when you log off at the conclusion of today's Journal Club, you will see a short survey to complete. We will use this information from the survey to keep our content current and engaging. I will now turn our session over to Dr. Odorico to begin our presentation. Thank you very much and uh, welcome to everyone who's joining us today. Uh, thanks for uh, joining us uh, for this AST-AJT uh, Joint Journal Club. Uh, it's my privilege to, uh, to introduce Jonathan Friedel, uh our uh, featured speaker today. <clears throat> Dr. Fredell completed his medical degree at McGill University in Montreal and his, uh, then went on to complete his surgical residency, his general surgery residency at the same institution. And thereafter, he uh, went on to do an abdominal transplant fellowship at the Thomas E. Starzl Transplant Institute at the University of Pittsburgh Medical Center. Uh, he is board certified uh, in two countries, both in the United States and Canada, as a fellow of the American College of Surgeons and a fellow of the Royal College of Surgeons of Canada. He began uh, his transplant faculty at the University of Indiana uh, and specializes in pancreas, liver, kidney, intestinal, and multivisceral transplantation. He is currently a professor of surgery and director of the pancreas transplant program there. And he now serves as chief of transplantation uh, at Indiana University. Under his leadership, the pancreas program has consistently been a top performing program in the United States in terms of both uh, volumes and outcomes. Dr. Fredell previously uh, chaired the UNOS kidney and pancreas transplantation committees. Uh, and he has uh, been involved in academics as a deputy editor of the Clinical Transplantation Journal and also on the editorial board of the journal Transplantation. He has written extensively on the topic of pancreas transplantation with over 150 publications and has received numerous recognitions for his work in this area including being inducted into the American Surgical Association over the past year. Dr. Fredell's uh, topic today for the Journal Club is about the survival benefits uh, of kidney, uh, of pancreas after kidney transplantation or PAK transplantation, a topic of uh, great interest in the field uh, for a number of years now. And uh, he's going to present to us some of his work uh, and other work in the in the field in in this area. So I'd like to welcome Dr. Fredell to uh, deliver his uh, journal club. Um, thank you much for that introduction. Um, I'd like to start off by saying what an honor it is to be selected uh, to present this particular article. Uh, we're very proud of this work. Uh, this was a project. Uh, that was done by the UNOS Pancreas Transplant Committee. Uh, at the time that we did this work, I was the chair. Uh, and of course, John Odorico, who just introduced me, took over as chair shortly after. Uh, but this was a labor of love. Um, 
I wanted to also start off by wishing everybody a happy Star Wars Day. May the 4th be with you. And I also wanted to point out that, uh, I guess a few months ago, this would have been very difficult, but I think we've become very savvy with the whole webinar, teleconference, Zoom type of presentation. Uh, so I think we're perfectly ready for this. Um, in terms of conflict of interest, I have no relevant financial relationships to disclose. Uh, but this was a work of the UNOS Pancreas Transplant Committee, so uh, usually we have to disclose the contract with HRSA uh, when we present work that was done by the OPTN. So when there's a patient who has uh, kidney failure and happens to be a diabetic, there's a lot of potential options that they can look at. Um, they can stay on dialysis. Um, they can get a kidney transplant, which could be either a living donor kidney transplant or a cadaver kidney transplant or they can get a pancreas and a kidney, and that can be either a simultaneous kidney pancreas or a pancreas after a kidney. Uh, when we look at pancreas transplants in general, there's a lot more diabetics than there are people who qualify for a pancreas transplant. The average diabetic would come and see us and they would be an individual who has diabetes, who takes insulin, who is uh, needing to monitor themselves closely, and is at risk for lifelong complications of their disease, uh, kidney failure, vision loss, vascular issues, neuropathy. And if we were to do a pancreas transplant, they would undergo a big operation, but ultimately they'd end up immunosuppressed for the rest of their lives. And the immunosuppression means that they have to take medication, monitor themselves closely, and they're at risk for toxicities of the drugs and uh, infections and cancers so we would usually call that a stalemate, and the vast majority of diabetics don't qualify for a pancreas transplant. Usually what tilts the scale is that they need another organ, and of the different organs that they could need, it's almost always a kidney for diabetic nephropathy. And once they're committed to needing a kidney transplant, which is clearly life prolonging, uh, that takes the immunosuppression all out of the equation and heavily tilts the scale in favor of getting both organs if they're a good candidate for that. The only time I'm going to mention this is now. Pancreas transplant alone is for patients who have intact kidney function, but their diabetes has got uh, such profound complications that they're potentially lethal. And the most common example of this is hypoglycemia and awareness, usually the type of hypoglycemia and awareness where they have uh, loss of consciousness or frequent emergency room visits, um, frequent uh, EMT visits to the house. Uh, and these are patients that we would consider doing a pancreas transplant even though we're not doing another organ and putting them on immunosuppression. The risk of the diabetes outweighs the risk of the immunosuppression. So when you come back to all the different choices that you have, um, if the person is a candidate, we tend to lean heavily towards trying to make them both uh, no longer uremic and no longer diabetic. Um, this is what pancreas transplant looks like on the top left in the US and on the bottom left worldwide. Uh, basically, as the technology is improved, as we introduced immunosuppression and as we introduced preservation solutions, there was a steadily increase in the number of pancreas transplants that were performed. And then around 2004, there was a sudden drop that went on for more than a decade. In 2015, we had a little bit of recovery, but we're still nowhere close to where we were about a decade before that. <clears throat> Worldwide, Outside of the US, we see a similar climb in the number of pancreas transplants. And in the last five or 10 years, we've seen a plateau and perhaps a decrease as well. If you look by categories, which is the right bottom picture, the green line is the SPKs, and that was the initial increase that was uh, seen in the first graph. And, graph. and uh, then you see a plateauing of SPKs with a gradual decline of probably 100 or 200 a year. Uh, pancreas after kidney is the red line. Pancreas transplant alone, we're not going to talk about that's the blue line. But the red line has this steady increase that starts in the mid to late 90s with the introduction of routine laparoscopic donor nephrectomy for living donors. So we were very excited about the idea of doing a laparoscopic donor nephrectomy, do a living donor, and then do the pancreas after that. And then something happens in 2004 and you get this abrupt drop off to the point where Pancreas after kidney and pancreas transplant alone are about the same volume annually. Uh, this is work that we presented, again, from the UNOS Pancreas Transplant Committee at the International Pancreas and Islet Transplant Association meeting in 2015. This is OPTN data. What I'm showing on this slide is all of the pancreas patients 
this is the number of pancreas transplants we did, which declined. Um, this is the number of additions to the waiting list, which shows a, a decline. And this is the number of registrations at year end. And the point is that one of the main reasons we're not doing transplants is that we're not listing people for transplant. And of the different groups, the steepest decline starting in 2004 was the number of patients that are being listed for pancreas after kidney. So it, it's not the unwillingness to transplant them. It's, it's, the, it's not the lack of organs, it's the unwillingness to transplant them. I am specifically showing an old slide here. This is what life looked like in 2004. This is pancreas graft survival. And what you can see from this is that SPK clearly has the best long-term pancreas graft survival of the three different types of transplants. If you get a kidney and a pancreas from the same donor, the pancreas has a better long-term survival. Um, but the pancreas after kidney and pancreas transplant alone are similar. And basically at one year, SPK is 85%. And at one year, pancreas after kidney is at 78%. The historical conclusion was that if you put both organs from the same donor, you would watch the kidney and you would detect a problem because the creatinine would go up, you'd biopsy the kidney, you'd figure out there's a problem, you would treat it and you would save the pancreas before it even saw a problem. Uh, there's also some that felt that getting the two organs down regulated the immune system, but probably the firmest held belief was that if you save the kidney, you save the pancreas. So now if you look at today's numbers, and that's top right over here compared to 2004, you can see that the same pattern still exists. SPK has the best long-term long -term survival. Pancreas after kidney and pancreas transplant alone are similar. What you also see is that the one-year graft survival has increased substantially for all the groups. SPK has gone up to 89.6. Pancreas after kidney is actually very close to where SPK was a decade before. Um, and if you look at, again, we were talking about the immunologic graft loss and picking up the problems beforehand, you can see that SPK has a much lower immunologic graft loss than the PAKs and the PTAs. When you look at five-year immunologic graft loss, you'll see that more progress has been made, however, for pancreas after kidney and pancreas transplant alone, where immunologic graft loss is at least improving and it's been re reasonably stagnant for SPK. We wrote this paper in 2009. Um, we were just looking back at our graft survivals for all the different transplants that we did. And incidentally, we noticed that the pancreas after kidney had the same graft survival as the SPKs. Um, this was uh, 270 patients. The majority of them were SPKs. It was probably something like 65 patients were pancreas after kidneys. The pancreas after kidneys in our system was uh, skewed heavily towards pancreas after cadaveric kidney because we had a local center that wasn't doing pancreas transplants. So they would list the patients for kidneys and tell them that they didn't qualify for a pancreas. And then when we started doing more pancreas transplants, we brought them back and told them, I know you didn't qualify because you were too old a decade ago, but now you're okay. So now we would offer all those patients pancreas after kidneys and they did very well and the pancreas graft survivals were similar. This motivated us to look back at all the papers from that era that we're using some kind of T cell depleting induction, either rabid antithymocyte globulin or alemtuzumab, and using some kind of variation of tacrolimus and either sirolimus or mycophenolate mofetil. Uh, there is one outlier, that's the uh, group from Minnesota, that's Grusner's paper over here, where they used CAMPATH and mycophenolate mofetil, and they used the CAMPATH as maintenance. Um, but if you look at all of these studies, one of the things that you'll find is the immunologic pancreas graft loss was very infrequent. Uh, so it actually worked out to of the close to 400 patients from all these studies, it was about 1% of all the patients that actually had immunologic pancreas graft loss. So it was our opinion that maybe with certain immunosuppression protocols, we were saving some of these pancreas grafts. And so you can see in this bottom picture over here where they looked at uh, depleting antibody and serolimus-based protocols, uh, now we still have the same thing, SPK is the greatest pancreas graft function, but the graft survivals of one year were all up into the 90% ballpark now, much better than any of the prior SPK pancreas graft survivals. This conversation should really focus about the patient requiring a kidney transplant. So if a recipient needs a kidney only and they have a living donor, most of us would say, well, we should do a living donor kidney transplant, and the evidence is obvious. 
if you do 11 donor kidney transplant, this is the top left picture compared to a non-extended criteria donor compared to extended criteria donor, you have an incre incremental decrease in long-term survival. And that's one year, three year, and five year. And this one over here actually included a group for SPKs and they showed that cadaveric kidney compared to living donor kidney, there is a huge kidney allograft survival advantage to getting a living donor kidney. But the kidney pancreas, which was a better than usual standard criteria donor kidney, performed better than the other cadaveric kidneys, but still not as well as a living donor kidney. And the bottom two both show that getting a kidney preemptively has also got a huge survival advantage for the kidney allograft. The altruistic argument for doing a living donor kidney rather than doing a cadaver kidney is that there are so many patients that are waiting for a kidney, and every time you do a living donor kidney, you give back another kidney to somebody who's waiting on the cadaveric list. And specifically for patients who are waiting for kidney pancreas, you are giving a very high quality standard criteria donor back to the waiting list. I included this um, article which if you recall my previous one, the case for pancreas after kidney transplantation, it was published in Clinical Transplantation, mated with this article and with a, an editorial by Dixon Kaufman. Uh, this was a very interesting study that looked at pancreas after living donor kidneys, uh, compared them to not only patients who got kidney transplant alone who were diabetic, but they split them into two groups for the ones that were kidney transplant alone, were eligible for a pancreas transplant, but didn't get one as opposed to patients that got a kidney transplant because they didn't qualify for a pancreas transplant. So this was a very elegant study. And the top two uh, Kaplan-Meier curves, you can see that patient survival is very similar between the two groups. And they had a splaying after about five years or so where the uh, kidney survival was actually statistically better for the patients who got a pancreas as well as a kidney. When you look at the hemoglobin A1C, clearly the patients who got a pancreas did better. When you look at the GFR, the patients who got a pancreas also did better. And if you were to get a kidney and not a pancreas at the same time, you'd probably get your kidney earlier if you had a living donor. And once you got your kidney, you would probably get your pancreas earlier as well. This is dated information, but the rule still stands that basically allocation is local, practically mandatory. And then when you get beyond local, which isn't gonna exist soon, but once you get beyond local, um, then the pancreas is usually offered alone and the kidneys are kept close. So um, maybe John will want to elaborate this when we're done with my presentation, but there are a lot of isolated pancreas grafts that weren't used locally as part of a kidney pancreas that are available for pancreas after kidney but would not be available for an SPK. Okay, so now we're starting to get into the reason why we wrote this paper in the first place. Uh, this was an article written in 2003 uh, published just on time to, at December 2003 to have been largely responsible for the decline in interest in pancreas after kidney transplant. Just to walk you through what they were thinking at the time, this is the waitlist survival. This really deep bad one is the waitlist for a patient who's on dialysis waiting for a simultaneous kidney pancreas transplant, or at least in renal failure waiting for a kidney and pancreas transplant. Um, up here you have the patients that are waiting for a pancreas after kidney or for a pancreas transplant alone. So those are patients who have already received a kidney and are waiting for a pancreas. Post-transplant survival, you can't even tell which line is which. They're superimposable lines. All the patients had the same survival. Uh, very important, please note this. This goes out to four years. It doesn't go beyond four years. Um, this type of analysis over here on the right is the relative risk of death analysis. For SPKs on the top, you can see that the relative risk of death is favoring death in the first 90 days which we believe is related to post-operative issues. And beyond the first 90 days, there's a survival advantage, clearly statistically significant, for a patient who's getting an SPK. Jonathan, we lost you, I think. Um, but erring towards a survival disadvantage for the PAKs for the next um, three and three quarter years. And then for the overall group, it reaches statistical significance for favoring not doing a pancreas after kidney based on survival. Now, this has been rebutted. Um, this is an article, one of two of them written by uh, the Grusners, by Reiner and uh, Angelica Grusner and by David Sutherland, representing the uh, International Pancreas Transplant Registry, but using the same database that was used for the prior study. 
uh, they found several statistical issues with uh, subjects that were counted multiple times, uh, subjects that were excluded. One of the main exclusions that should not have been excluded were patients that uh, got a pancreas after kidney, but the kidney function was not updated after the kidney transplant. So they were still listed as having a creatinine greater than two. Those patients were all excluded from the study. Um, and then there were patients who got a kidney alone and should have been recategorized, but were not. Uh, when they repeated the analysis, including and excluding all the right patients, uh, they found that pancreas after kidney had a survival disadvantage in the first 90 days. They showed that they had a um, mixed result for the first year, but beyond the first year, there's a survival advantage and equivocal for the overall, as opposed to the SPK, which like the prior study showed, a survival disadvantage at the beginning, then a survival advantage in the first year, and after the first year, and then overall. And again, this is their wait list for SPK, their wait list for pancreas after kidney, and their wait list for a pancreas transplant alone. And once again, the overall survivals are superimposable. This is my favorite slide of the presentation. If you're going to stop for a second and, and gaze at something, this is the one. Um, this is work from the University of Wisconsin showing their 1,000 SPK transplants. This is with a sort of an unprecedented 22-year follow-up. Uh, in this study, they compare dialysis to deceased donor kidney, living donor kidney, and SPK. And I don't think this is a surprise, but a diabetic patient on dialysis gets a huge survival advantage from any kidney transplant. If they were to get a living donor kidney transplant, they would have even more of a patient survival advantage. What was very surprising from this analysis was that there was a splaying even further if they were to get a pancreas with their kidney, um, but this doesn't occur until after the first four years. So that's a very important point. If you're gonna do a survival analysis, four years is probably inadequate. That's one of the first most important points. Here's the second important point. If you have a patient before you who would like to have a kidney and a pancreas transplant, that is the point where you make your decision. That is where you decide we are gonna do a kidney pancreas or we are gonna do a living donor kidney followed by a pancreas after kidney. It's unusual to have patients who show up to you who decided to have a kidney transplant and then decide that they would like to have a pancreas transplant. So we think that this is an error in judgment because all the previous studies used wait list for pancreas after kidney as the wait list for comparison to post-transplant survival, which all was the same for all three groups. Um, instead, this is the proper group to say, these are the patients to compare wait list compared to getting both a kidney and a pancreas after kidney. So we basically took the same data set that they looked at for all of the previous studies updated. Um, we did our study from 1995 to 2010. We picked 2010 because we were interested in having a lot of 10-year follow-up for our study, and not four-year, but 10-year follow-up. We excluded pediatric candidates. Um, it is somewhat confusing in the UNOS databases, but patients who get a pancreas as part of a multi-organ transplant count as a pancreas transplant. These were all excluded. Any organ other than a kidney and a pancreas was excluded from the transplants. Um, we also included patients who had a creatinine listed as greater than two. Uh, overall, we had 25,361 25, candidates recipients in the cohort. We had 5,636 PAK candidates, 3,358 received both a pancreas and a kidney. We had 19,725 SPK candidates, and of those, 12,308 were transplanted. So we had a lot of information to work with. Um, there were some statistically, statistically significant differences, which happens when you work in tens of thousands of data. Um, what I will point out is in most places, like for instance, for BMI, um, for age, uh, for allocation PRA, and for HLA mismatch, if there was going to be one that was favored over the other, it always favored SPK over pancreas after kidney. But I don't think any of these numbers are actually clinically important. I don't know if there's a big difference, even though it's statistically significant, in a BMI of 25.2 compared to BMI of 24.9, for instance. Uh, we looked at wait lists and post-transplant mortality by transplant type. We looked at survival rates for kidney and pancreas graph for PAK recipients by deceased and living donor transplant type. And we compared survival rates for staying on the wait list compared to receiving a transplant at 90 days, one year, and annually thereafter by organ type. 
<clears throat> on the top left, like we showed you previously, you have your waitlist survival. Uh, again, the waitlist for the SPK is the most profound uh, mortality. Uh, the pancreas graft survivals are shown on the bottom left. Uh, same pattern we've seen for all the others where SPK has the best pancreas graft survival and the PAKs and the PTAs are down here. Um, on the right, you have the survival analysis like you saw previously. Uh, SPK compared to waitlist for an SPK is the top one. And you can see, again, there's a survival disadvantage for the patients in the first 90 days. And then after that, there's a survival advantage at all the time periods, including from zero to 10 years. When you looked at the pancreas after kidney, it's the first time we actually see a survival advantage for the surgery, which I think is a statistical aberration. But uh, in this particular comparison, when you compare patients who got a pancreas after kidney, patient survival to the patients who are on the wait list for the SPK. So if they got a kidney and a pancreas with this wait list, then you see a huge survival advantage. This was the biggest surprise of the study. This is the kidney graft survival. What we found with the kidney graft survival, uh, we looked at a deceased kidney, no pancreas, deceased kidney with a pancreas, living donor kidney, no pancreas, living donor kidney with a pancreas, and SPK. Uh, the very surprising result was that, first of all, living donor kidney with a pancreas had the best overall kidney graft survival. What was surprising was deceased kidney followed by a pancreas after kidney transplant was second on the list. SPK was the yellow one over here, which was below the living donor kidney transplants. And then the bottom one was a cadaveric kidney donor. So this sort of layers out nicely and strongly is in favor of doing a living donor kidney followed by a pancreas from the perspective of the kidney allograft survival. So candidates who receive a pancreas after kidney have longer survival compared to candidates who do not receive either a kidney or a pancreas. For pancreas after kidney candidates, Receiving a liver donor, living donor kidney increased kidney graft survival. Receiving a pancreas increases kidney graft survival. Receiving a living donor increases pancreas graft survival. That's not shown. And we also completed sub-analyses, looked at all kinds of different cohorts, including BMI, including race, including age, and the results were otherwise all very similar. Um, this article was uh, greeted with a letter to the editor uh, from the group in Barcelona, Spain. Uh, they had uh, generally, they agreed with what we had to say. They did critique that using such a large uh, time span um, from 95 to 2010, uh, that hemodialysis had improved significantly and SPK results had improved significantly. And they were worried that that was uh, tainting the results, that maybe we should be leaving patients safely on hemodialysis rather than rushing to doing a living donor kidney transplant followed by a pancreas after kidney. They cited one of their own studies where a pancreas after kidney was associated with higher mortality due to technical complications. Uh, they suggested looking at long-term rather than 12-month results, which we felt sort of contra contra contradicted their first point. And they suggested SPK would be ideal if the wait time would be less than two years. Um, we wrote a rebuttal. So the original letter was, do we still need to demonstrate survival benefit of pancreas transplantation? And our rebuttal is, yes, we do need to demonstrate survival advantage of pancreas after kidney transplantation. Uh, we pointed out that we required that really long time span in order to have 10-year follow-up. Uh, we also pointed out that looking at hemodialysis survival might be misleading because specifically what you have to look at is the diabetic patients on dialysis, and they have the least good survival on hemodialysis. So it's urgent to get them transplanted. We pointed out again, the priority should be the kidney transplant. Uh, our own practice is to consider listing the patient for an SPK. And then if they have a living donor to work up the living donor, and if the living donor is worked up and they're ready to go long before they're gonna be at the top of the list for SPK, then we, pr we proceed with the living donor kidney followed by the pancreas after kidney. Uh, we will also do that if we get an offer for a zero antigen mismatch kidney where the pancreas is not usable. We'll accept that zero antigen mismatch kidney and then look for a pancreas after kidney. Um, and in terms of their publication, it was an 18 subject uh, study um, of the patients that got pancreas after kidney. There were three retransplants and two ABO incompatible. There were four mortalities and uh, they were all late and two of them were retransplants. 
So these would be interesting, interesting reading for people who are looking at this article because we will go over a lot of the details that you heard in our paper reiterated in a different way when you look at our rebuttal to their uh, discussion. I'd also like to point out that um, the work by the UNOS Pancreas Transplant Committee on this topic uh, resulted in a guidance document. Uh, so in addition to the manuscript that we have published, uh, there's also a guidance document on best practices for pancreas after kidney, which will include a lot of the data that you just saw, some of it presented differently, and in some there's an embellishment to some of the issues. Um, I also wanted to point out that a lot of the discussion regarding living donor kidneys um, and preemptive transplant, uh, the availability of pancreas allografts after you do a living donor kidney, uh, were all covered in this review article that we wrote for current opinion in organ transplantation uh, and would also be really good supplemental reading. So conclusion, survival is superior with any kidney transplant and even better with living donor kidney transplant and even better yet with a preemptive transplant. It seems clear that receiving a pancreas with the kidney is associated with a significant improvement in long-term survival. Uh, this is only evident beyond the first four years. Uh, pancreas graft survival is better for SPK than PAK, but the gap is closing. Um, and from a kidney perspective, the best results are achieved with a pancreas after kidney followed by a living donor transplant. Um, sorry, we're achieved with a pancreas after kidney following a living donor kidney transplant and ideally a preemptive living donor kidney transplant. And that's my last slide. And I want to remind you again, happy Star Wars Day, everybody. Okay. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Fridell, for uh, a really superb and comprehensive review of the topic. Um, I'll just point out for the listeners that there's really no person anywhere more well-versed than Jonathan Fridell to talk about this topic. So uh, you've heard it uh, straight from the expert here for sure. Uh, let me uh, say to uh, the listeners that it's possible to type in some questions and uh, Jonathan will take some questions at this point, I'm sure. So we have a couple already. Um, uh, so uh, the first question from one of our listeners is, uh, were you able to separate waitlisted patients who are active and versus non-active? And how did you define censoring event? Uh, how did you handle second transplants after a failing graft? I presume that's with re reference to the uh, AJT paper and the uh, UNOS analysis. Yeah, um, the retransplants was an exclusion is my understanding. Um, I don't have a good um, answer for what to do with patients that were parked on the list. So I, I'm assuming what they're asking is what do you do with inactive patients? Uh, I believe this was a study of active patients on the list, but I don't know. You know, the statistical analysis was done by our OPTN staff, and I'm not really sure how they handled that. John, do you recall that? You know, I don't recall. I, I think it was just uh, taking active patients, um, but I, I don't actually re uh, recall because it was quite a few years ago now. Um, I'm looking uh, quickly. Another question. question. Go ahead, Jonathan. Yeah, ask the next question. I'm going to look quickly while you're asking. Yeah, we have another question from another uh, listener. What was the average time frame between kidney transplant and PAK in the cohort? It was long. <laughs> that was in the um, that was in our um, what's it called the uh, position document the. In this document, they go into that, but it was very long. Um, I remember being struck that they had patients waiting like as long as five or six years in between the two. Uh, from a single center study, uh, like for instance, the, um, the Minnesota paper that I quoted, they actually took it apart into whether they waited less than a year, a year to three years. They really split it up based on how long patients were waiting. In ours, we took all comers um, and, and it, was, it was long. <laughs> Mm -hmm. And a follow-up to that, Jonathan, just a corollary question. In, in your particular practice, uh, what would you consider too short? What is the minimum waiting time? And uh, is there a waiting time beyond which you'd get a little nervous or uh, a particular 
condition of the recipient where you get a little nervous, uh, then offering them in, or getting them active on the PAK list, let's say after yeah. X number of years, or if they had some other issues between when they're, after their kidney was done and they're, they were being considered for a PAK. I don't have a too late time limit, uh, but I'll tell you, we did play around a lot with the too early. Um, originally, we, you know, there are programs that do a simultaneous living donor and cadaveric pancreas transplant. But I think in order to be able to do that, you have to have an infrastructure that can call in a living donor laparoscopic nephrectomy team that can happen at the same time as the pancreas transplant. And a lot of those um, pancreas transplants happen at inopportune hours. So now mm -hmm. you're talking about doing a laparoscopic donor nephrectomy at three o'clock in the morning. Um, so th that hasn't really taken off. Um, but trying to capitalize on that, we tried to see if we can get a pancreas as quickly as we could right after they got their living donor kidney, thinking that then we would just need one induction immunosuppression and we wouldn't need to do a repeat when you did the pancreas after kidney. And, and I'll tell you, the patients really don't take that double hit very well um, to the point where we stopped doing it. Um, we used to do like a living donor kidney and you know, somewhere like one to five days later, they would get a pancreas transplant. Uh, now we sort of mandate that they wait for a period of at least three months just to completely recover from their kidney transplant before we knock them down off the ring again. Great, thanks. What's uh, your private have, question? What are you guys doing in Wisconsin? Oh, uh, well, we've done it as late as nine, 10 years afterwards. Uh, and we have some intramural analysis where we've uh, analyzed whether the interval uh, conveys any increased risk. Uh, we've done it as soon as several uh, months after transplant. Or, um, uh, and I recall a Minnesota study showing that up to uh, as early as three months was safe, a small study. Um, yeah. And uh, so um, we haven't been able to show a significant detriment or increased risk with a long-term interval, but uh, there are some particular situations in a recipient that I would get a little bit more nervous about. Um, but um, anyway, uh, I don't think that question's been fully answered yet, and, and perhaps it's a, a numbers issue. Um, yeah. We have another uh, question from the reviewer uh, or the listener here. Uh, can you explain how you say there's a survival advantage for PAK when there was 28% uh, death and 13% uh, in kidney transplant patients awaiting a pancreas transplant? Um, it would seem to me that there was an increased risk of death in the PAK group. Um, so I'm not sure I'm getting the question quite right, but that's what it says in the question list. So maybe, Jonathan, you, could you review the, the, the rationale of, uh, of, of the, uh, the benefits again? Uh, the survival benefit, as you mentioned, is reference to the uremic diabetic on dialysis, but to, maybe you could go over that again. Yeah, um, well... We were we were comparing the patients in this group over here, so sorry, in patients who got a a pancreas transplant. That's the previous slide. One second. Nope. Where's that? Give me a second to muddle through. Ah. So we were looking at the that's the pancreas. Where's my patient survival? Huh. Okay. Over here in the um, the forest the right side it shows. You know, I, I just realized what I'm. I didn't show the patient survivals, which were the overlapping lines. Um, I just realized that I showed the pancreas graft survival. I didn't show the patient survival. Uh, right. But basically, the uh, the patient survival with both transplants was overlapping lines. Uh, I'm wondering if what they're asking is is this mortality. I'm not really sure, because I mean, in terms of the and the hazard for, for mortality, I mean, there was a marked survival advantage to having received a pancreas after a kidney, receiving both organs, compared to the patients who got a simultaneous kidney and pancreas transplant. Um, so I'm not, I'm not really sure how else to phrase that. 
I think that addresses uh, the uh, waiting for the pancreas, the patients that died waiting for the pancreas. I'm not really sure. I think that's part of the question, uh, but uh, I, I think it really one needs to emphasize, as you did, that it goes back to the uremic patient waiting on the waiting list and that the patient uh, death that occurs between the kidney and the pancreas needs to be factored in also. Yeah. Another question is, um, what about simultaneous living donor kidney and deceased donor pancreas? I think you mentioned that. Do you want to highlight that again? Yeah, I, I think that's a great option if you have the infrastructure to handle it. Um, I think the results um, sure look like it approaches doing an SPK because you get the, the best version of the kidney because it's a living donor kidney. Uh, because you're simultaneous, you're doing one operation. Um, you get one induction, so you don't have to do two courses of induction uh, immunosuppression. Uh, but the grafts do come from two different people. But I don't think they've been done in large enough volume to tell whether or not the pancreas graft survival is going to follow the pancreas after kidney or the SPK. Uh, but I, I certainly think that if we had the infrastructure to do it, I, I think that that is a, an optimal way to do this. Great. Uh, another question related to best practices for HLA matching. Uh, is it relevant between the two organs? Is it not? Um, what considerations are there? Um, that's a good question. I think um, the way that we look at it is the way we would look at it for a first transplant or even for a second kidney, for instance, is, is we look at the cross match. If they have a PRA, we look at the cross match with the PRA. Uh, we don't personally try to match for HLA, uh, either, to the don either to the recipient or to the prior donor. Um, and uh, when we look back at our data, having not done that, I think our pancreas after kidney survival didn't seem to care. Mm -hmm. Good. Another, quite a few questions here, Jonathan. Um, and perhaps it's because it's a complex uh, topic and a interesting decision modeling uh, and many factors that go into the decision modeling. But we have one listener that's asking, can you review your approach to counseling candidates who do not have a living donor yet? How much do you counsel them in to get a living donor? Uh, and is the counseling emphasis more if the SBK waiting time is long? It's a great question. Um, yes, the answer is yes. Um, so when I meet uh, patients who are uh, looking for a kidney and a pancreas transplant, I always cancel him about living donor kidney transplant. And I um, certainly when we identify someone who has a living donor, I encourage them to go through the process of listing for an SPK and bring their living donors forward. But if I see that somebody is on the list for an SPK, has a living donor, but they are going to get their SPK within the next one or two people, I usually will go and wait for the SPK. I uh, would reserve this if I think it's going to have a huge time advantage for the patient. Um, and I sort of look at it as if we do the SPK now and they have their living donor now, well, if they ever do need another kidney, they still have their living donor in their back pocket. Um, on the other hand, if I think that the wait for an SPK is going to be longer than a year or two, if our list looks like it's got a fair number of people on it, I will strongly encourage the people on that list to look for living donors. But absolutely, the size of the SPK list and how long it'll take the SPK list to get through certainly plays a role in how we advise patients. A corollary of that perhaps is do you, uh, if the patient does have a living donors available, do you uh, place any uh, emphasis on the further advantages of an HLA identical kidney versus a uh, haplotype or non-matched living donor kidney? Do you mean if they have a living donor who's a really good match? Yes, or if there's a no non-matched living donor uh, versus uh, versus an SPK cadaver donor kidney, for example. Where the SPK is well matched or where the living donor is well matched? Can you say that again? 
where the living donor is well matched or where the SPK is well matched? Or am I misunderstanding the question? Where the living donor is well matched. For example, in the living donor um, out kidney transplant outcomes versus uh, in the kidney transplant outcomes of a living donor versus a cadaver donor that comes with a pancreas for an SPK, those living donors are of different uh, makes, so to speak. There's, there's some of those are going to be HLA identical, some of those are going to be haplotype identical, some of them are going to be non-matched. Yeah. Um, uh, at all. So um, the, the analysis that uh, was done in this case was not really, did not really separate those out. Do you have any thoughts yeah, about? Um, our practice, I think if we identify or lack thereof. Yeah, I think in terms of our own practice, I we, we don't go looking for that. Um, I can't think of a case where we lucked into a zero antigen mismatched living donor. Um, you know, and if it was somewhat matched but not zero antigen mismatch, I don't know if we would do anything differently. Um, and if they had a zero antigen mismatch, that might be one of the few cases where, you know, the the living donor kidney and pancreas not done by us because we don't know how to do that, but that might be an option um, because I think that the immunologic special cases or the highly sensitized patient who has a living donor that's well matched to them. Uh, I would definitely go with the living donor rather than hope that we get the SPK. Um, usually we're able to ultimately find a pancreas alone, but once they've got their living donor kidney, it's a lot easier to look around the country for a well-matched pancreas alone than it is to wait for an SPK to pop up. Mm -hmm. Yep. Another question, another important question looking to the future is that uh, what do you envision as the, uh, with the new pancreas and kidney allocation system coming in place uh, likely in the future, uh, per perhaps by January of 2021, uh, what do you think is the result uh, in terms of pancreas uh, transplantation, particularly with regard to PAK and PTA allocation? So will broader sharing and elimination of DSO uh, have any impact, um, do you think, uh, for PAK and PTA volumes or um, allocation across the country? Yeah, well, this is this is very far off topic. Um, I, I have very strong feelings about the allocation, but I'm not sure how high up on a soapbox I want to get. <laughs> I think that, um, you know, currently, if you look around the country, most programs tend to use what is currently known as a local pancreas donor, and very few programs import on large scale. Um, I think that Wisconsin certainly an example of a program that imports on large scale. Maryland, Georgetown, there's programs that really import. Minnesota, um, most programs don't do that. So I think having a new allocation system that really forces every pancreas to become an import is going to be a huge change in philosophy for how pancreas tra transplant programs work. And I think we're either going to see a further drop in volume or we're going to see increased enthusiasm for importing. And I think that there'll be a honeymoon period and then we'll see where we land. Um, not being clairvoyant, I don't know how it's going to look. Uh, my guess is that uh, it, it, it's probably better to be waiting for a pancreas after kidney once they start broader sharing than it will be for an SPK. Because I think if we broadly share the SPKs, a lot of SPKs are gonna go flying around. What do you think, John? You were very involved well, I in think, that. Well, I think I have some concerns as well. I have some concerns as well. I think it remains to be seen. I think there'll be some narrowing of uh, the field. I think, I think some centers will start to accept imports from slightly larger area, but from you know across the country, uh, 1,000, 2,000 miles away, I'm not so sure, but perhaps slightly outside their DSA might become a little bit more common. Um, I think it remains to be seen. I think it'll be very interesting. It's an experiment. Another question is uh, um, along those lines about geography, does different geographic areas in the US which affect deceased donor kidney transplant waiting times, should that influence the decision 
of the uh, decision model of PAK versus SPK. I think you pointed out that it uh, perhaps should um, based on the expected waiting time. But uh, if you could elaborate on that anymore, John. Yeah, I think that's true. I, I think if there's a place where um, I think we lost you, Jonathan, there for a minute. Sorry. Dr. Fordell, we had lost you for a second. Could you repeat your answer? You hear me now? Yes, we can. Yes. Okay. I think that um, we were talking about geography. I think if there's a program that's performing slowly, um, so they they do a low volume transplants, they get excellent outcomes, uh, but they're not particularly aggressive. So the patients sort of sit on the wait list for a while uh, and they kind of keep on skimming along like that. Um, if it looks like their patients are going to be waiting for a kidney and a pancreas for two years, three years, but we'll ultimately get them and we'll do fine. Uh, my personal bias is that they should probably be offering those patients a living donor kidney transplant because the less time you spend on dialysis, the better the kidney allograft outcome is. Um, so I, I, I personally think it would be smart to get those people a living donor kidney. Um, and then I think it's going to be up to the program, but I would also suggest that they should strongly consider doing the pancreas because I think that not being diabetic in the long run um, has an impact on the patient's survival. Okay. Uh, another question is related to uh, minimum uh, kidney function going into the PAK. Do you have a minimum GFR cutoff um, for your patients going into pancreas after kidney transplants? That, that's a great question. No, we don't have a minimum, but we look at them on a case-by-case -case basis. Um, one of the things that we want to see is what their GFR is if they're on full immunosuppression. So the difference between doing a pancreas alone on a patient who is not currently on immunosuppression and doesn't have a fabulous kidney function is that once you put them on the calcineurin inhibitors, you're going to see a drop in their kidney function. Um, so if the person is doing well with proper levels of immunosuppression, uh, we'll usually tolerate, um, I don't know, GFR 40, 45, maybe a little bit lower. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. We usually prefer it to be higher, but we, you know, on full immunosuppression, we'd be happy with that. Yeah, I think I agree with that. I think that's a reasonable uh, threshold. Um, another question is related to the uh, sequential induction that might occur with a pancreas after kidney, uh, especially if the interval is short or otherwise. Uh, what is your preferred uh, initial induction and what do you feel comfortable with with regard to a second induction therapy for the pancreas um, and how does immunologic risk uh, cross match DSA etc play into that? So um, our typical immunosuppression is rapid antithymocyclobulin induction. Uh, we do solumedrol pre-medication for the thymo uh, but other than the solumedrol that we give them before their dose is a rapid antithymocyclobulin, we don't use steroids at all. Um, our maintenance immunosuppression is tacrolimus sirolimus, uh, with a you know reasonably low threshold if they're having uh, wound problems or if their creatinine's up to switch them over to mycophenolate mofetil or myfortic. Um, that being said, if we do them very quickly after transplant, instead of doing five milligrams per kilogram daily, one milligram per kilogram doses. Uh, we'll probably drop that down to two or three if they're within the first few months after. Once we started going beyond three months, we decided to give them the full induction. Um, we have we've checked back on our CMVs. We've written a paper on CMV after transplant using this induction protocol, and it wasn't greater for the patients who got a pancreas after kidney and had the two inductions. And as far as being sensitized, um, we don't think about it that way. We treat the current antibodies, DSA, PRA, the same way as you would, no matter how it showed up. Um, so if they got it from a kidney or if they got it from a previous pancreas or they got it from a pregnancy, from a transfusion, if they have PRA, we always treat it the same way. Uh, pretty much defaulting to the virtual cross-match, but we still cross-match all of our patients anyway. Mm -hmm. Cross-match, we're good to go. 
Very good. And the induction the induction's pretty much the same. We played with rituximab for a little bit. Pretty much we're only using that now for the isolated banks. Mm -hmm. Do you have any concerns about using CAMPATH back-to-back -back in a PAK situation, first for the kidney, then for the pancreas? So I have used elemtuzumab on maybe three patients in my career, so I'm not the right person to answer that. Mm -hmm. um, do you guys use CAMPATH? Uh, we do and have used it for the kidney side, and uh, we have have some experience with pancreas retransplants after CAMPATH induction of the first transplant, be it either kidney or pancreas. And we found that there uh, are better results with uh, thymo after CAMPATH than CAMPATH after CAMPATH. I should use the word and elantizumab, I suppose. So um, because uh, and just as a dis, uh, yeah. disclosure, the, or a uh, you know, we should mention that none of these uh, drugs are um, fully approved for pancreas transplantation. So just to, I'm sure everyone's aware out there, but just to mention it. Dr. Odorico and I have a long working relationship, so you'll part in the back and forth with the questions. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, a couple more questions here. Um, uh, let's see. Um, Can you uh, reflect on uh, less nephrotoxic immunosuppression options uh, now potentially available in the P, uh, in for pancreas transplantation in this or other scenarios? Can you do that again? Uh, are there other less nephrotoxic immunosuppression options uh, for pancreas transplantation? Yeah, it's funny. I actually we maximize our nephrotoxicity. Because uh, we're calcineurin inhibitor and serolimus, um, I I I liked the idea of what they did in uh, Minnesota um, with the camp path uh, maintenance and no calcineurin inhibitor, uh, but I I don't think that that quite did what they hoped it would do. We have maintained um, quite a few of our patients on the uh, IL two receptor antibodies and either mycophenolimophetol or serolimus in order to get rid of our calcineurin inhibitor, not immediately after transplant, but if they did get in trouble. Uh, we've used basiliximab. Um, so we have, we have tried some of these things, but not out of the gates. We've used them afterwards. Mm -hmm. um, and I suppose also that uh, Peter Stock study, the, uh, was that basiliximab? Oh, that was, that? That? That was um, the Latticept, mm -hmm. the Bella study. Right. Yep. So uh, that was being used as a calcineurin inhibitor sparing, and then ultimately withdrawal protocol. And I think it was very promising as a sparing, uh, but the withdrawal was not so pretty. Um, we have used uh, Bella uh, occasionally instead, the same way as we use Simulect. We use Bella as an alternative to tacrolimus in some of the patients with. Uh, kidney issues long term, but not again right out of the gates. That's potentially good role for it, as well as uh, kind of a conversion, late conversion. Um, yeah. Just to highlight that uh, CTOT trial that you pointed out that was just recently uh, published uh, the conversion, um, or not the conversion, the late withdrawal of uh, calcineurin inhibitors after calcineurin inhibitors sparing in the early phases after SPK was uh, potentially risky. Uh, there was a high incidence of pancreas rejection, surprisingly, but not kidney rejection shortly after uh, late withdrawal, after nine months of stability, late withdrawal of, uh, of calcineurin inhibitors in these belatacid treated patients. So I think there's uh, still a bit to be learned there, as you pointed out. One last question, Jonathan, related to uh, what are your thoughts about or experience with pancreas after, or excuse me, kidney after pancreas transplants with doing mm -hmm. a pancreas transplant first for the potential benefits? And then if patient loses GFR uh, or has proteinuria or is has uh, underlying diabetic kidney disease, eventually needs a kidney transplant, 
or the situation of a pancreas after a failed islet transplant after kidney transplant. Let's say the patient had a previous uh, islet after kidney transplant, the islets didn't work, and would you consider them eligible for a pancreas after islet after kidney transplant in that? Part? Okay, second question first. Um, islet after pancreas, absolutely. Um, we've done quite a few of those. Frequently, the patients are sensitized, but we tend to find them organs. Uh, we just ignore the fact that they had an islet transplant and we treat them like any other candidate looking for either a pancreas transplant alone or an SPK or a pancreas after kidney. Um, we've also had patients who were after total pancreatectomy and auto islet transplant. And so we've done pancreas after auto islet transplants. Um, in terms of the other question, which was uh, kidney after pancreas, um, I would say that we have done kidney after pancreas transplants. Um, usually pancreas transplant patients on dialysis is not a good thing. I think the majority of them, if you leave them to natural selection, are going to lose their pancreas as well. Uh, many of the patients who got a pancreas and then needed a kidney ended up with needing both, uh, particularly the patients who needed a pancreas and a kidney and then something happened to the kidney. Uh, we have tried doing uh, isolated pancreas transplant where the person identified a living donor beforehand. Um, and then in maybe both cases where we set everything up and everything was ready, the living donors kind of disappeared when we needed them. Um, mm. So I am not a fan of pancreas transplant alone, followed by a potential living donor rescue. Um, but if you are sure that you have a living donor, it is certainly a possibility. I have always thought that the pancreas transplant alone with poor kidney function should qualify for the safety net, just like the liver kidneys did. Um, and uh, maybe it's something the pancreas committee can consider at some point, is that uh, saving them from getting a kidney pancreas and then doing a rescue if they ultimately need one might be a very reasonable thing for a patient who is having a lot of hypoglycemic episodes. It's probably going to die from their diabetes, but doesn't have the renal function to justify a kidney transplant or to support the calcineurin inhibitors. Yeah. Okay. Very good. Well, we've had a lot of questions from uh, the listeners, uh, and it's been a uh, the, you've been a great audience. Um, would you? Uh, I'll, th I'll thank you again, Jonathan, for your uh, for your excellent presentation. Um, I, I'll give you a few minutes to summarize. Would you like to summarize your uh, overall conclusions and why you think this is important, and what your next what you think of the next steps, perhaps, uh, if you wouldn't mind for the group. <clears throat> I could just reiterate our conclusion. I think that uh, pancreas transplants has dipped significantly since 2004. I think pancreas after kidney was the biggest drop. Um, I think it's been abandoned by many people. A lot of it has to do with that Venstrom paper. I think that paper has been rebutted several times, and our main goal here was to rebut it using the exact same data source um, and fix a lot of the things that were wrong. So take the data beyond four years, and to compare it to the patients who are really being referred to you, not the patients who halfway through their treatment got the kidney need a pancreas, but the patients who are actually waiting for a kidney and a pancreas. So overall, it seems that survival is superior with any kidney transplant. It's even better with a living donor kidney transplant, and even better yet with a preemptive transplant. It seems clear that receiving a pancreas with the kidney is associated with a significant improvement in long-term survival, but that only becomes obvious after four years. Pancreas survival is better for SPK than PAK, but PAK is catching up and it's certainly surpassed where we were 10 or 15 years ago. And from a kidney perspective, the best results were achieved with a pancreas after kidney followed by a living donor kidney. So I think that pancreas after kidney has a role. Um, if your wait time for an SPK is reasonably short, I don't think it's wrong to pursue the SPK, but I think if patients are gonna be waiting for a while, I think it is very reasonable to do a living donor kidney followed by pancreas. Well, thanks for that summary again, Jonathan. Um, and thank you once again for a great presentation. It's a uh, really this is uh, you've been thinking about this and and uh, investigating this topic for many years, uh, and it shows that uh, with the depth of understanding of the issues. Uh, involved in the decision, complex decision tree that uh, there is for these uremic diabetic patients. And I think it also reflects why there was such great interest in this. Um, 
topic. Um, so, so thanks again for your great presentation, and thanks again for the listens, listeners for their questions and, and attention. I think we'll end the uh, webinar now, and mm -hmm. I guess, uh, Jonathan, I'll let you say it. Hey, the the fourth. Fourth. <laughs> <laughs> AST would like to take a moment to thank our panelists, Drs. Ferdell and Odorico, and all of our attendees for joining us today. Please remember to complete your evaluation survey and visit myast.org slash journal club to view our video archives and register for upcoming journal clubs. For those questions that we did not have time for today, we will either answer them individually offline or we will post the full question with the answer on the website following the journal club. To learn more about AST's Kitty Pancreas Community of Practice, please visit myast.org slash COPS or connect directly to the KPCOP Hub. Thank you very much.